Therefore, it is time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Uh, Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. The government hired a company to build a bridge over the 401. One catch, the company had never built a bridge. The result, the company installed the bridge upside down at a cost of millions of dollars for the government to fix shoddy work. How did the Liberals react? They rewarded the company another $39 million in government projects. You know, I wouldn't be shocked if this is the norm for this government. Mr. Speaker, how many other bridges have been built upside down? Mr. Speaker, it's ridiculous that I even have to ask that question, exactly. but yesterday's AG report is ridiculous in terms of what we're hearing that your government has done. It is completely unacceptable. Question. How many other bridges, how many other projects like this have happened? <laughs> you seated, please. You seated, please. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Derek Duvel wants to <clears throat> well, thanks very much, Speaker. I uh, want to begin, of course, as I said yesterday. I want to begin, as I said yesterday, by thanking the Auditor General for her report and for the recommendations contained in her report, Speaker. Uh, the member of the, uh, the, the, the the leader of the opposition is raising a, a project, obviously uh, managed and completed by Metrolinx. I would say uh, here today in the House, as I said in the media studio yesterday, over the last five years, uh, Metrolinx has completed 275 construction projects. Speaker, uh, the majority of those projects has been completed on time and on budget. Speaker, uh, I do thank again the auditor for her recommendations. I know that Metrolinx will continue to work hard. A couple of things to keep in mind, Speaker. In March of this year, about eight months ago, I provided the chair of their board with a letter of direction. We've received the report back. Yes, we now have a, a tighter opportunity to provide oversight with the agency. Uh, the agency is also deploying a new Thank vendor you. performance Thank management you. system. And I. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, since I can't get an answer on the upside-down bridge and. The minister is trying to say that there's more wow. oversight. Read um, let's read the headlines. The headline today, infrastructure incompetence. And the bridge, I'll, I'll quote one description, the most spectacular item in the report's cavalcade of nonsense, but not by much. That's because the Auditor General highlighted the ministry's sheer ineptitude, their incompetence when it comes to paving our highways. Asphalt should be laid for 15 years, but in Ontario it cracks after one or two years. Not surprisingly, no one is held accountable. The minister says everything is fine, even after one section of the 403 cost $12 million to prematurely repair. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain why the Liberals allow our, hi our highways to crack and crumble? Does it have anything to do in the $100,000 in donations from these companies to the Ontario Liberal Party? <laughs> Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I, um, I, have a list of I want to, uh, Speaker. I want to reiterate that I thank the auditor for her recommendations, not just as it relates to Metrolinx, but as it relates to MTO and the management of our construction project. Speaker, I think it's important to make sure that the uh, accurate facts are uh, are on the record. Uh, over the last seven years, which is the period of time during which the auditor was referencing some of MTO's construction contracts, over those seven years, Speaker, what we've seen using the same objective criteria from seven years ago versus today is that provincial bridges and provincial roads are dramatically improved in terms of their quality, Speaker. And that's because our government speaker, that's because our government speaker has understood how critical it is to make sure that we are investing in transportation infrastructure in every corner of this province because of years of chronic underinvestment when that party was in power, Speaker. We're going to keep working hard to make sure that we get it right. Thank Thanks very much. Final supplementary. What an answer that is. Mr. Wow. Speaker, again to the minister, wow. uh, no answer uh, on the upside down bridge, no answer on the $100,000 in donations. I know it's their talking point to say, I thank the Auditor General. The Auditor General called your government incompetent and inept. So let's speak very specifically. Again, on Highway 403, paved in 2006, redone in 2008, redone again. Stop the clock. Okay, I. I did try to make an effort to allow you to kind of find your spot, and you're not finding it. 
Um, I am also going to remind members that even during the heckling, I'm not impressed with hearing names other than the titles or their writings. Uh, so you've decided on your own uh, by giving you the time to do so that you're going to be somewhere I can't tolerate. I may have to move to warnings right away. And uh, you can give me any kind of face you want, and if it continues, you'll be leaving. <coughs> Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, Highway 403 paved in 2006, again in 2008, again in 2011, and it will need to be paved again in the near future at an added cost of millions of dollars to taxpayers. That doesn't include the 686000 bonus to the, the company received for not doing the job properly. That's their style of government. Mr. Speaker, Question. how many other companies did the minister reward bonuses for not doing their job? Is that the order of the day in your ministry? Wow. <laughs> Thanks very much, Speaker. You know, Speaker, I got to say there have been a lot of there's been a lot of allegations that have been tossed around in the leader of the opposition's questions this morning, Speaker. I'm going to say right off the top, I'm pretty sure those sleazy tactics worked for 10 years in Ottawa when he was a Harper crony. They don't work here in the province of Ontario, Speaker. Let's let's remember something fundamental about that leader and that party, Speaker. In my time here as an MPP, here's a short list of the projects that they voted against, Speaker. Go Regional Express Rail, LRTs in Toronto, Peel, Hamilton, BRTs in York Region, Durham Region, new streetcars in Toronto, Union Station revitalization, four-laning of Highway 69, the Morriston Bypass. This list goes on. Minister of Agriculture is not helping. Wrap up, please. Speakers, I was saying that leader in that party, the, four, the 410 widening, the 407 phase one and phase two, 417 upgrades Answer. in Ottawa. That party's transportation policy amounts to killing the Eglinton subway and selling our 407. Thank you. Any question? The leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Deputy Premier. Since I can't get an answer on the upside down bridge that the minister supported, I'm going to try something else. First, it was the environmental commissioner who raised concerns about cap and trade. Then it was the financial accountability officer who raised concerns, and now it's the auditor general. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the auditor confirmed what we've been saying all along. Less than 20 percent of Ontario's emission reductions will actually occur here in Ontario. Wow. The Liberal scheme will barely make a dent in pollution wow. in Ontario. And at the same time, this is unbelievable, we're going to send 466 million wow. to Quebec and California wow. by 2020. And all that money is going to leave Ontario. Mr. Speaker, why do the Liberals want to subsidize companies and businesses Question. in California? Thank you. Maybe the um, Mr. Speaker. Maybe the Leader of the Opposition should talk to his critic who's briefed up on this because clearly he has not been briefed up on this. The cap-and-trade system and the, the 3.8… The member from Simcoe Gray, come to order, please. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker. The 3.8 megatons comes from the cap-and-trade system. An additional 9.8 megatons comes from the results of the action plan reviewed by economists. If you do the math, that's the vast majority of reductions being secured over the next five years. That was the work done by David Sawyer. The 3.8 is the groundwork Answer. before the ca you calculate the action plan, Mr. Speaker. But then he's the member who wants to put $157 a ton price on carbon, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Uh -huh. Mr. Uh, Speaker, ag again to the minister, clearly the minister has not read the AG's report. So let me share with you what the Auditor General said. Quote, small reductions in emissions in Ontario come at significant cost to business and households. Quote, the Climate Action Plan contains unrealistic, unsubstantiated assumptions. Quote, 
And here's another assessment by the AG. Ontario's cap does not actually control the amount of greenhouse gases that can wow. be emitted in Ontario. Wow. That's a stinging, stinging indictment, Mr. Speaker. Sure the Liberal is. cap and trade scheme has fatal flaws this yeah. government is ignoring. And the worst part? Without a new agreement between, with this new agreement with the USA and Canada, not a single one of the credits purchased from California will count towards our emission credits. So, Mr. Speaker, this is unbelievable. Why do the Liberals want Question. to force Ontario businesses to subsidize, to subsidize businesses in California, in Beverly Hills, on a, a Rodeo Drive, and do nothing Thank to you. fight pollution in Ontario? <laughs> The member from Beaches East York is, is uh, warned. And if you don't get the idea, I'm in warnings. Minister? Thank you very much. I'll try one more time. It's not that hard. Two numbers 3.8 megatons achieved by the market. We understand that? That's not me. That's the. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. The member from Nipissing is warned. Anyone else? Carry on. 3.8 megatons achieved by the market mechanism. Very clearly stated, David Sawyers, reviewed by everyone, all the nine large emitting industry associations chose cap and trade support that. 9.8 billion, 9.8 megaton. The result of eight billion dollars of reinvestment in Ontario's industry achieves them. Yes, and this is the difference between our plan. Yours is revenue neutral. You have no money to reinvest in St. Mary's Cement Thank or you. Nova Corporation. You Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, again uh, to the minister. I asked a simple question to the minister that he's not answering. I asked why is the minister setting up and committing Ontario to a plan that sends $466 million to Quebec and Ontario by 2020. The Auditor General, sir, Quebec and California, the Auditor General has pointed out this will grow to over $4 billion by 2030. The minister will become the best minister of economic development that California has ever seen. This isn't the opposition saying this. This is the Auditor General. This is the independent oversight saying that your plan is flawed. It does not curb Hear me, this does not curb pollution in Ontario. This does not fight climate change in Ontario. All it does is make businesses less competitive, and it doesn't meet our emission targets. So hearing what the Auditor General has said, Question. will the minister do the right thing, take a pause, fix this, because it's clearly broken? Do the right thing for Ontario. Thank it's you. not too late. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister? Mr. Speaker, since I, I can't seem to get him to understand some two simple numbers, let me try another approach. Every year, $42 billion in imported fossil fuels is paid, purchased by Ontario's family and businesses. The environmental commissioner says if we did not have cap and trade, those costs just for the families alone would go up $300 million a year. We will be dramatically reducing that $41 billion in annual expenditures, which is why all of the industry associations do that, because they are all fuel switching to local Ontario-generated clean energy, creating jobs in Ontario. Now, I know the member doesn't understand that because I watched him for 10 years in as a member of parliament destroying every provincial initiative Answer. to reduce submissions, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Question the leader of the third party. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting premier. On Tuesday, I met with Jean Bastien, mine manager, and a number of miners at Richmond Mines near Dubreville. These are hardworking women and men, Speaker, who have uh, a love for what they do and a love for where they live. And the company is hoping to actually hire more employees, Speaker. But the skyrocketing electricity costs are a big problem for them. They're hampering the company's efforts to expand and create more jobs. The sell-off of Hydro One is going to make things even worse, Speaker, not better. Will the acting premier do the right thing for jobs in the north and stop any further sell-off of Hydro One? 
Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. We all are concerned about ensuring that the people of Ontario, everywhere throughout Ontario, have good paying, high value jobs. And certainly the mining sector is critical as one of the many sectors of Ontario's diverse economy. And that enables us, frankly, to weather economic storms, including when commodity prices hit the global markets. It happens so in Ontario as well, but because of our diversified economy, we were able to balance out and continue to prosper and still exceed Canada the G7 and the United States in the last quarter. But more importantly, the member makes the accusation, however, that by broadening the ownership of Hydro One and somehow making it a much better run company to be more efficient and to ensure that we deliver better results uh, and reinvest them to build more infrastructure, including, frankly, greater investments and stimulus in the mining sector. Answer. Uh, that I don't, I, I just don't, don't believe the premise of her question, Mr. Speaker. You, supplementary. Speaker, I also met with the mayor of White River as we visited the White River sawmill. Like all companies in the forestry industry, hydro is a huge part of their costs. And although they're trying to expand and breathe life into the economy in these northern towns, they're worried about their ability to do so uh, because of the cost of their electricity bills, because they, those bills continue to soar. Speaker, we should be building on successes and supporting job creators, not stopping them. Will the acting premier do the right thing for White River and for the White River Mill and start getting hydro rates under control and stop the sell-off of Hydro One? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, in order to make some of our industries more competitive in the marketplace, it's essential for us to provide some of those supports. And that's exactly what we are trying to do, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the reference to Hydro One and the, uh, rec and the, and the, the, uh, the assumption, the, the presumption that somehow making Hydro One a more effective company, which is one of 72 different distribution centers in the province of Ontario, uh, would negatively impact an industry is not the case. What is important, though, is the programs that we do have in place, working with New Europe and, looking, and working with some of our northern programs to provide some of those supports to program and, and enable those companies to foster the return on their investment as we provide for more predictability on those rates. That's what's happening, Mr. Speaker. We're working with a number of sectors to do just that. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's not just businesses who rely on hydro that are worried. I also met with Sharon Hill, a retired nurse that's almost 80 years old. We sat her at her kitchen table in the Sioux, Speaker. Her hydro bills have hit $300 a month. She heats with baseboard electric heating. She's living on old age security because she doesn't have a company pension. She doesn't know how she's going to be able to afford her hydro bills for the rest of the winter. After a long, full life, Speaker, people shouldn't have to worry about something as basic as being able to pay their hydro bills. Whether you're a minor, Speaker, whether you're a sawmill operator, a young family, or a senior like Sharon Hill, your biggest worry is your hydro bill. Will this acting premier, will this Liberal government do the right thing for Sharon and people like her and get their hydro bills under control and stop making it worse by selling off hydro one? Proceed, please. Thank you it, please. Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, we agree that families, especially those most vulnerable, need more support. It's why we on this side of the House have been taking and putting programs in place to foster and support that, and we've done so also with a number of industries uh, in the North. In fact, Mr. Speaker, when you consider a low-income family in the North or in rural on, uh, Ontario, we've taken the, the, the following steps. We recently announced the 8% uh, HST rebate. We expanded the rural and remote rate protection program. That combines up to 20% improvement. We provided the Ontario Energy Support Program for low-income home uh, low-income uh, families, that's $600 a year in savings. We have the Northern Ontario Energy Credit for $224 in savings to provide for some more support for Northern consumers. And, Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit can save an additional $1,000 a year. I hope the member opposite, when she makes uh, these discussions and has the ongoing discussions with these families, that she provides yes, them with support and mechanisms that's available to them that we put forward 
so enable those families to have better, better support, you. Mr. Speaker. We're doing our part. We know we need to do more. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Speaker, Speaker, my next question is for the Acting Premier. People want to believe in the future of Ontario. But yesterday's Auditor General's report shows that the government is making decisions that are not about people. Hospitals are overcrowded. People are waiting nearly 40 hours for acute care that they should be receiving in eight hours. They're waiting longer to see a family doctor. And the Auditor General said information about wait times for surgery is misleading. How did the Liberal government get things so wrong, Speaker, so messed up? How did things get so bad? Thank you, Deputy Premier. The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I, as I said yesterday, I uh, welcome the Auditor General's report, uh, and I accept her recommendations as they pertain to our health care system. Uh, I welcome her report each year, Mr. Speaker, just like I did last year. Her two reports that referenced our uh, home and community care program, and it provided me with important guidance on how to move forward. Uh, I welcome the, her comments and recommendations with regards to how we can continue to improve uh, our hospital operations so that they better serve our patients. Uh, but it is important to uh, acknowledge the progress that is being made, Mr. Speaker, and I'm happy in the supplementary to uh, reference some of the third-party data that we have uh, that was made available and uh, some of it, in fact, referenced by the uh, Auditor General that shows the improvements that have been made uh, over the past number of years for wait times in ERs, for hospitalization, and the outcomes that we're looking Thank for, you. Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, having a good future here in Ontario means having a good job to go to every day. But the Auditor General said that the government's job programs are a mess. Half of the people who enter an apprenticeship aren't finishing, and the second career and employment services programs are helping less than 40 percent of the people who are trying to build a better life with a better job. This government is letting people down. The Auditor General's report is clear. They are letting people down on many, many fronts, Speaker. When will this government start focusing on people who are trying to get a better job? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm going to continue to talk about the progress that we've made uh, in our emergency rooms, for example, where we had a report that just came out in the last number of weeks from HQO, uh, Health Quality Ontario, that shows that despite an aging population, despite an increasing population and seeing more individuals in our ERs, we've seen significant improvements in the shortening of the wait time in our ERs right across this province. So, and the Auditor General referenced yesterday that nine out of every Ontarians are seen and discharged from our emergencies in the province within the target, the provincial targeted time, and that was validated by the work that HQO did uh, earlier as well. And on other aspects of short times, just in the past year, and this is information that was just made available by the Fraser Institute, so perhaps wasn't referenced in the AG's report, uh, but wait times for general surgery have gone down by 13 percent. For elective cardiovascular surgery, wait times have gone down by 36 percent just in the last year, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, while people are finding it harder to get a job and waiting longer for the health care they need, the Auditor General said in the meantime the government's spending more on misleading partisan advertising. Ah. The Liberal government needs to explain to the people of this province why people who need health care and people who are looking for work are at the bottom of the pile, Speaker, at the bottom of the list for attention from their government. And if the Liberal re-election campaign needs another $20 million for partisan advertising, they seem to be able to find the money in the public purse, Speaker. Can the Acting Premier explain to a person who has spent hours in an emergency ward waiting for a bed or trying uh, really, really hard to find a new job why the government is more interested in their own re-election campaign than in helping those folks get what they need. So, Mr. Speaker, I take the analysis of the Auditor General very, very seriously. I take her recommendations very, very seriously. There's no question that there is much, much more work to be done within our health care sector uh, right across the board, including in our hospitals. But it is important to acknowledge that the, when we've invested upwards of a billion dollars specifically to reduce wait times in our health care system over the past roughly one decade, we have made significant progress where the Fraser Institute uh, described 
describes us as being the best or among the best in terms of shortest wait times uh, for uh, selected surgical procedures. Mr. Speaker, the Wait Time Alliance has given us straight A's as well on their report card in terms of having the lowest or near the lowest wait times in all of Canada. We have the shortest wait times in the whole country in that important period from seeing your family doctor or nurse practitioner to getting to see the specialist. We have the shortest wait times in the whole country, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Sir. We have the shortest wait times in the whole country for CT scans, MRIs, and ultrasounds. So we need. We, there is more work to be done. There's no question, Mr. Speaker. But we made significant Thank you. progress. Question: The member from Dickerson. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Rather than address their own incompetence, the Liberal government continues to attack the credibility of our independent experts. Shame. The Auditor General says their numbers can't be trusted. The Deputy Premier says, quote, we take issue with the auditor's accounting practices. The Auditor General questions why millions in bonuses were awarded to underperforming contractors. The Minister of Transportation doesn't think her perspective is, quote, representative of what reality is. Well, the minister needs a reality check. The people of Ontario trust our independent, nonpartisan auditor, not a Liberal government that is mired in waste, mismanagement and scandal. Speaker, will the government stop attacking the credibility of Question. our Auditor General and look into their own incompetence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To the President of the Treasury Board. President Treasury Board. Yes, thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, I, I thank the Auditor General for uh, her report. And obviously, we do need to work with the Auditor General and uh, and uh, continue to uh, continue to. Uh, uh, work with her on our public account. But I think it's important to remind the member opposite that the Auditor General actually agreed with our analysis of our public accounts for the year just passed. In fact, we used the numbers that the Auditor General prescribed to us. There is no disagreement right. over the, the numbers, and the Auditor uh, agreed right. with the accounting that That's we right. used in, in the uh, public account in the past year. So to suggest that Answer. somehow we're uh, undermining her, her work is just simply not we true. We used yeah, her yeah. numbers. Thank you. Three and a half. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, back to the Deputy Premier. Uh, the Auditor General and the Financial Accountability Officer have revealed the gov government has subjected Ontario taxpayers to record tax increases, right. endless cuts to frontline services, and years of waste mismanagement and scandals. Yet the Auditor General says the government somehow managed to spend $50 million on shameless self-promoting advertisements. Advertisements the Auditor called, quote, misleading, quote. Absolutely. While this government continues to make you, you, cannot, you cannot say indirectly what you cannot say directly. You will withdraw. Okay. Speaker, I'm quoting from the Auditor General here. Please be seated. The member from Leeds Grenville is close to a warning. I do not want that challenge of the chair. Carry on. Speaker, while this government continues to make life unaffordable for Ontario families, Question. they're advertising on the taxpayer's dime. Mr. Speaker, will the government end their tax increases, cuts to frontline service, and end their shameless self-promotion? Here, 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 here. President, President, President yes, thank you very much. I would like to remember, the, remind the member opposite that Ontario is the only jurisdiction in Canada, one of the few in the world, that in fact has a government advertising that we have banned partisan public ad, uh, government advertising. We're the people that did that, and you're the people Chair, that voted against that. And let's just look at your record. Look at your record. Between 1995 and 2002, the Conservative government of Mike Harris spent over $400 million on government advertising. That's what you spent. And I know you remember the day, speakers, with those horrible, horrible ads. Stop the clock. Start the clock.
New question. The member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting premier. Speaker, the government is spending even more money on partisan government ads. Yeah. The Auditor General calls these ads misleading and points out that these advertisements are, and I quote, Stop the clock. I'm trying to explain that you cannot say indirectly what you can say you cannot say in, uh, directly. Even quoting somebody else using that language is not acceptable in this House. The member will withdraw. Stop. Fear, carry on. <laughs> the, these advertisements are spending tax dollars to reinforce the partisan messaging of the Ontario Liberal Party. Yes. Unquote. Can the acting premier explain why she thinks government ads should be presenting their own messages, whose only purpose is to help the Liberal Party? Thank you very much. And I would like to uh, remind the member opposite that our legislature, legislation, which is the strictest in Canada by far, actually bans partisan that. government advertising. It, does, it, it provides a clear definition of partisan advertising. We, you cannot use the uh, name of any member of this House, government opposition. You cannot criticize or support any member of this House. There, you cannot use any partisan, uh, partisan logo. Subtle reminder, we are in warnings, and I will continue to use them. And what comes after warnings are naming. Finish, please. Liz. Liz. So we have a very strict advertising regime, but what we do do is share information with the public. So we have shared information with the public about vaccination. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. Finish, please. We've shared. We've choose away from being named. Finish, please. Yes, we've shared information about changes in the rules for childcare and to help educate parents on how to distinguish between what's licensed childcare, what's not licensed childcare. Answer. How do you respond if you think there's pro a problem in childcare? Those are all things that we have spent money on advertising. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, everyone in this House knows that that government watered down the advertising rules in this province. Everybody. And, and, and the auditor knows it as well, and she's called you out for it, and everybody knows about it. The practice of using government-funded ads to bankroll the Liberal Party's re-election ads in, adds insult to injury for the people of Ontario. Parents sitting in hospital rooms with sick kids have to watch commercials claiming this government has reduced emergency room wait times. Meanwhile, in Kitchener-Waterloo, our local hospital is fundraising for emergency room residents to address the wait times. Instead of looking out for Ontarians who are waiting for health care, this Premier has been solely focused on getting herself re-elected and using government money to hold on to power. Speaker, Question. will the Liberal Party pay back the money that they spent on partisan advertising in this province? Thank you. President. You know, it's really interesting, and I understand that the uh, member opposite wasn't actually a member of this legislature when we brought in the original government uh, advertising bill in 2004. The one that she claims that her party is so strongly supportive of. But in fact, if you go back and check the voting record. A member from Leeds Grenville is warned. You're close. If you go back and check 
attacked the roading record in 2004, yeah. the NDP voted against the oh. legislation that they say they want to defend. And one of the members of the NDP caucus at the time is the current leader of the third party. Now, the member who's asking the question may not remember that. We remember it, and the public Answer. record of Ontario remembers that the NDP voted against the Chair, legislation please. they are defending. Good. New question, the member from Northumberland, Clinton West. Well, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is the Attorney General. This, uh, this Tuesday, is family and members of the LGBTQ2 community across this province were inspired and moved by the historic passing of All Families Are Equal Act. I understand that before the passing of this bill, many families who use assisted reproduction faced unnecessary barriers. The LGBTQ2 plus parents were forced to spend time and money to be legally recognized as their children's parents. I have heard that this experience can be painful and humiliating for families. That's not fair and it's not right. The Attorney General will, will most likely agree that having a child will be a wonderful time, not a time filled with uncertainty and anxiety. Can the Attorney General please tell this House how all families are equal act how all families are equal act will help Question. families across this province? Thank you, Attorney General. Thank you uh, very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Northumberland and Quinty West for asking this very important question. Uh, Speaker, people in Ontario value diversity and equality. All parents and their kids need to be treated equally under the law, and I'm pleased that the All Families Are Equal Act has passed in this legislation. This bill updates our law so that all kids are treated equally by recognizing the legal status of their parents, no matter if their parents are LGBTQ2 plus or straight, and no matter if they were conceived with or without the help of assistance. Speaker, this legislation will update Ontario's parentage laws to make the law as inclusive as possible. It is really that simple. We're doing this because parents should not have to go to court to be recognized as their child's mother or father. And Speaker, let's make this absolutely clear. We are not removing mother and father with this legislation. Answer. We are broadening this legislation to ensure equality for all families in Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Attorney General for his response. I'm pleased to hear that our government is committed to ensuring all children are treated equally by recognizing the legal status of their parents, no matter their parents are all or are LGBTQ2 plus or straight. Many in this House will recall that the law governing legal status of child parents and birth has not been sus substantially changed in nearly 40 years. A lot has changed since then. In the year 2016, there was no, there was no one way to, to start and raise a family. Family structure, just like this great province we, cannot, we call home, are more diverse than they were so many years ago. This bill represents an historic movement in our province. Can the Attorney General tell us more about the families and communities that help, help shape this important Question. legislation? Thank you. Attorney General. Speaker, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And the member is right. This is a very historic moment uh, for our province. Ashton. This Legislative Assembly stood on the side of equality by voting for this bill and showing the support for the LGBTQ2 plus community and the values of diversity that are so important uh, to Ontario. The spe issue, uh, speaker, this issue was raised by families who are raising their children with love and respect and uh, dignity, something that we all, all wish and hope for um, in our families across the province. And Speaker, I personally found it very disappointing that some members of this House thought and called that uh, legislation a horrible legislation, Speaker, when the legislation is all about making sure that kids have certainty as to who their parents are, that it's all about ensuring that there's equality uh, for all uh, uh, parents, uh, regardless of who they are, Speaker. Answer. That's what this legislation does, is make sure that our children are loved all the time, and I'm glad that members of this House voted in support of this historic legislation. Thank you. Your question, the member from Melbourne, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, the PC caucus has consistently raised examples in this legislature of how the Liberal government's rationing of health care dollars is negatively affecting patients. The Auditor General's report yesterday confirmed that wait times for surgeries have increased and the health of those waiting for life-saving treatment has been jeopardized. 
Due to chronic underfunding, elective and emergency surgeries must compete for OR time. 25 per cent of patients with critical or life-threatening conditions must wait double the expected time for surgery. Only 33 per cent of neurosurgeries were completed within the ministry's target time. Mr. Speaker, will the minister admit his government's policies are failing Ontarians and explain to them why they should trust this government's plan? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I mentioned earlier, I uh, appreciate the analysis uh, and the narrative provided by the Auditor General, uh, her uh, very sound recommendations as they pertain to all elements of our health care system, including uh, hospitalization. Uh, and there is work to be done, and that is part of the reason why we're investing a uh, quarter of a billion new dollars this year in home and community care so we can pull out some of those patients that are occupying beds in hospitals that don't need to be there so that those wait times will be reduced even further. That's why we announced nearly half a billion dollars this year specifically for hospital operations this fiscal year to allow uh, us to address some of those capacity and wait time issues, including uh, for sur important surgical operations like hip and knee in the Southwest Lynn and in London, for example, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but we are making significant progress. And by any objective measure, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have solid evidence that the investments that we've made uh, in our hospitals you. have uh, borne fruit, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, the other general's evidence is showing this government is failing Ontarians. But it's not just the surgeries whose wait times are out of control. The Auditor General notes that the government is also failing Ontarians on accessing hospital beds when they need to be admitted. Patients must wait in the emergency room for more than 37 hours to get a bed, often in the hallways or other unsafe areas. Nine years of chronic underfunding and four years of frozen hospital budgets are hurting patients. The rationing of health care has patients waiting hours for life-saving surgeries. Operating rooms are going unused, and patients are stuck in hospital beds when they should be elsewhere. Ontarians deserve better from their government than having to wait for basic care. Speaker, Ontarians, the PC caucus has had enough of this government's excuses, waste, and mismanagement of our health care system. When will the minister acknowledge his failings Question. and end the rationing of health care? Well, Mr. Speaker, I can't even begin to imagine what it would be like if they had have succeeded with their campaign pledge to cut 100,000 jobs in education in health care, Mr. Speaker. But speaking of wait times in Ontario, I know that the member from Kitchener, Conestoga, asked yesterday about the emergency department at Grand River Hospital, and I'm happy to update him because he was concerned about wait times in the ER. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to update them that, in fact, the Waterloo Wellington Lynn is number one in all of Ontario, but the, the specific hospital, Grand River, has the shortest wait times for high acuity oh, patients in their that. ER of anywhere in Ontario. In fact, they're beating the provincial average by more than three hours, Mr. Speaker. They have for complex patients, but they're also beating targets for minor uncomplicated needs. And that Wellington, that Waterloo Wellington Lynn is number one in the entire Sir? province, has the best results ever recorded in Ontario history for e Thank you. Stop. Stop the clock, please. The Minister of Agriculture, Rural Affairs and Food is warned. New question, the member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la Première Ministre par intérim. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Acting Premier. Under this Premier, it is getting harder to access the health care that our families need. After years of cuts and layoffs in our hospital, people are waiting up to 37 hours in the emergency room. After years of bed closure, the auditors saw people on stretchers in hallways because our hospitals are dangerously overcrowded. After years of budget cuts to our hospital, the auditor found long wait time for surgery that are putting people's life at risk. How can this Liberal government keep failing the patients of Ontario by forcing people to wait longer and longer for the care that they need now? Thank you. So Long-term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and that's why I remain so troubled by the fact that that party, the third party, didn't support our budget that had 
$345 million of, brand, of new investments in our, in our hospitals in operating costs to help them deal with capacity issues. But the member is, needs to at least acknowledge when we have third-party experts, third-party entities that tell us that we actually, nine out of ten individuals that go to our emergency departments are discharged from those emergency departments within the provincial targets, within yeah. the national targets, Mr. Speaker. That. And that was validated in her report yesterday by the Auditor General. And in fact, despite increasing population, despite increased volumes seen in our emergency departments, we've seen just in the last five or six years significant Answer. progress in further reducing that. So it, where that figure for both low acuity and high acuity, nine out of ten patients are seen within their provincial targeted time. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The auditor's report is really an indictment of this Premier's record on health care. The Liberal government closed mental health bed, leaving people in distress, waiting without help for months on end. The Liberal government had squeezed hospital budget to the point that, the auditor says, 60 per cent of hospitals are deferring surgery to balance their budget. And while the Liberal government claims to publish wait time for surgery, the Auditor General found that the real wait time are months longer than what the government claimed. She says that the information is misleading for patients. Why is this Liberal government— I uh, don't have to explain myself again. You will withdraw. I withdraw. Finish, please. Why is this Liberal government cutting health care, closing hospital bed, and publishing wait times that are not accurate? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know uh, that their minister of cuts that they were proposing was going to shave yeah. $600 million out of the health care and education budgets. And when they were in power, Mr. Speaker, they closed 24 per cent of the acute hospital beds in this province. When they were in power, Mr. Speaker, they closed 13 per cent of our mental health beds in the entire province. But when we look at third-party independent analysis of our wait times, we have the shortest wait times from GP to special in the entire country. We have the second shortest wait times from specialists to treatment, including surgical procedures, 20 per cent shorter than the national average. We have the shortest, we have the the, we have the shortest wait times for CT scans, for MRIs, for ultrasounds. Just in the last year, Mr. Speaker, our wait time for elective cardiovascular <laughs> surgery, the wait time has gone down by 36 per cent, and the wait times for med medical oncology down by 39 per cent, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Yeah. New question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the President of the Treasury Board. In 2013, our Premier set out a bold vision to be the most open government in this country. And to that end, Ontario has released over 550 data sets and created an inventory of almost 1,300 actively maintained data sets, and those numbers do continue to grow. We've posted the mandate letters for each minister online, and we passed the Public Sector and MPP Accountability and Transparency Act. As a result of this important work, Ontario was selected as one of 15 subnational governments to join the Open Government Partnership. But we know that transparency means more than just posting information. It means giving the public opportunities to weigh in on government decision-making. Speaker, could the minister please tell us how her uh, Treasury Board is engaging with Ontario. Question. Thank you. President, Treasury Board. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Kitchener Centre for this question, and welcome to her constituents. Our government has been actively engaging Ontarians in an effort to create better policy, deliver better services, and improve outcomes. Last year, we posted our open data directive as a Google Doc and allowed the public, public to directly edit and comment on the directive. We've opened up our procurement directive for consultations to find out how we can make it easier for small and medium-sized businesses to do business with the government. Most recently, our government announced that we will spend up to $3 million in the 2007 budget to bring to uh, life ideas suggested and voted on by the Ontarians, an initiative of the Minister of Answer. Finance. So through open government, we are making the policy creation process more accessible to Ontarians and are engaging society Thank to you. help us co-create solutions. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker. It's very encouraging to see that the President of the Treasury Board has been reaching out to Ontarians and is helping them to engage with Queen's Park through this kind of policy. Now, Speaker, each week one of the ways that I share information with my constituents in Kitchener Centre is by recording a one-minute video blog, The Goings On at the Legislature. In this past week, I encouraged my constituents to get involved and submit ideas for the 2017 budget. Building pathways for Ontarians to engage is half the challenge, but as elected representatives, we also need to play a role in informing our constituents of how they can make a difference. Speaker, now that we've taken stock of what Ontario is currently doing, could the minister please tell us what's next for open government and how the Treasury Board plans to continue engaging with Ontarians? Wow, Thank you, President. Thank you, Speaker. And as the member previously mentioned, Ontario was selected as one of 15 subnational governments to join the Open Government Partnership, the only subnational jurisdiction invited in Canada and one of three in North America. As part of the Open Government Partnership, Ontario has been co-developing initiatives to further enhance transparency with Ontarians. We asked Ontarians to submit their ideas online, then we asked them to vote on the ideas that had been submitted, and then we sent the top 15 in the vote, the top 15 ideas, to public workshop sessions in Toronto, Ottawa, and to make sure we caught everybody online in an effort to publicly refine and discuss these ideas. And next week, I will be announcing Answer. new co-created commitments to further accountability at the Open Government Partnership Global Summit. Thank you. Thank you. Question, the member from Dufferin County. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Children and Youth. In yesterday's Auditor General's annual report, she highlighted many concerns about the Minister's lack of oversight of mental health services for children and youth. One of the concerns raised by the Auditor General is, quote, after audits in 2003 and 2008, the Ministry of Children and Youth Services has yet to make changes to ensure that agencies deliver mental health services to children and youth appropriately, cost-effectively, and on a timely basis. After 13 years, will the minister finally act on the recommendations made in 2003, 2008, and this year's annual report? Thank you, Minister of Respect, Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. We know the majority of mental health here in the province of Ontario and addiction issues begin at childhood or adolescence, and that's why it's, in so, it's so important to make sure that children and youth have timely access to supports when they need it the most. I'd like to thank the Auditor General for her report and efforts in developing uh, some advice towards government. And her advice is insightful and will ensure that we continue to prioritize the challenging needs of children and youth and families here in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we know when it comes to mental health, it's something that's always changing. Uh, the pressures in the systems constantly right. change, uh, but we've taken uh, the Auditor General's advice and we're moving ahead to implement a new funding model for children and youth uh, and children and youth mental health services. We're going to enhance oversights to hold service providers yes, accountable and expand our use of data to access uh, agencies' performance and improve quality. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. After 13 years and three reports, the Auditor General found that the minister is still not monitoring the delivery of services to ensure children are receiving adequate treatment. It's no wonder there has been a 50 per cent increase in hospitalization of children and youth suffering with mental health illnesses. The minister's lack of action on mental health has reached a crisis. These children have nowhere to turn. They need help, and they need it now. Use the 26 recommendations in the All-Party Select Committee on Mental Health and Addictions. Use the 11 recommendations in the Auditor General's report. After 13 years, when will the minister act? Yeah. Well, again, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, again, I want to thank the member for the question. Uh, in 13 years, there's a lot that's changed in mental health, Mr. Speaker. If we look at the province of Ontario 20, 30 years ago and today, we know that the stigma around mental health is drastically changed, and people are talking about this issue more. And, Mr. Speaker, we know 13 years ago and today, even the pressures in the system has changed. So we've invested $100 million into, uh, into new funding over the last five years, and we're seeing a huge difference. Mr. Speaker,
Speaker, community-based children and youth mental health agencies serve more than 100,000 young people annually. More than 4,000 Indigenous children and youth access culturally appropriate services in their communities, and more than 3,200 specialized consul uh, consultations for children and youth in remote rural areas through tele-mental health services. Answer. Mr. Speaker, again, things are changing in mental health, and we're leading that change. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, according to the Auditor General's report released yesterday, only 47 per cent of people who began an apprenticeship program in Ontario actually finished it. And the number of apprentices at risk of non-completion increased after the Ministry of Advanced Education and Skills Development implemented a monitoring strategy to overcome this very problem. There is a shortage of skilled tradespeople in Ontario. We need young people wishing to start a career in the trades to be successful so that they can stay here and build a future here in Ontario. When will the Liberal government stop setting up these young people for failure? Uh, well, uh, Speaker, I, I welcome the question. I thank the Auditor General for her remarks. And I can tell you we are not setting anyone, out, anyone up for failure. In fact, choosing an apprenticeship is a very smart choice, Speaker, and we encourage more young people to think about apprenticeships, apprenticeships when they're considering what to do after high school. What I can tell you, Speaker, is that prior to 2014, we were very focused on enrolling more people into apprenticeships. We were successful in doing that, but what we have to do now, Speaker, is focus on the completion rate. We, uh, we are moving forward with a modernization of the apprenticeship system, Speaker, where we need to uh, better support students to finish. We need to support employers in a way that supports the completion of those apprenticeships. Speaker. Answer. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, aspiring apprentices were not the only ones left behind by the poor performance of the government's employment and training services. Only 14% of Ontarians participating in the province's employment services program found full-time employment in their field of study upon completing the program. The government spent $1.3 billion this year alone on employment and training strategies with very little to show for it. How are the good people of Ontario who rely on these services supposed to get ahead? When will the government stop making these things worse for Ontarians and invest properly in the services that they need to build a prosperous future here in Ontario? Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Well, Speaker, I find it astounding that the member opposite calls uh, training programs uh, a waste of money. Speaker, these are really important programs. Do we need to do a better job measuring the impact, Speaker? Absolutely, yes, we do. And that's why Treasury Board now actually has a center for evidence-based decision-making, because we need to do a lot better job, not just in this sector, but across government, in actually defining the outcomes we're working to, to achieve, identifying those programs that are successful, investing more where we're getting the outcomes that we wanted, and less where we're not getting the outcomes. We need to, to bring that kind of rigor to all of our uh, program speakers, including those in employment supports. But I'm very confident that the organizations we have delivering these services in our communities are really committing to doing what's Answer. best for young people or older people who are getting support, employment support. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Speaker, the opposition often accuses our government of not paying enough attention to rural communities and has made claims in the past that we are mismanaging our forestry industry. All too often we hear accusations from across the floor that we are making lives harder for the people in Ontario. Speaker, surely they are mistaken. I know that our government has been investing in infrastructure such as roads and hospitals in all communities, including rural communities. But the human infrastructure is also important. I know that your staff in MNRF act as tireless advocates for our land and resources all across this province. Can the minister tell us what our government is doing to make sure that the everyday life of the people Question. in rural communities working in Ontario's forestry sector are in fact easier. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank the hard-working member from Barrie for her question. Making sure we're making 
Making sure that we're making life better for people living in rural and northern communities is a major priority for our government. Our government understands how important a strong forest product sector is to Ontario's economy and the key role that it plays in over 260 communities across Ontario. I encourage Ontarians to look for the leaf on Ontario wood products and cut your own tree when shopping this holiday season. Tomorrow. But it's why we've created the Forestry Growth Fund, which will provide up to $10 million annually for forest operations in our province. Earlier this week, we were pleased to announce that we're investing over $4 million into a sawmill in Eganville, which has consequently created and maintained over 100 jobs in the forestry sector, improving their everyday lives in the riding of Renfrew, Nipsing, Pembroke. So I encourage everybody to get out on December 6. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for her answer. I'm very pleased to hear that we are creating new jobs in both in rural communities and the forest industry. My father, Jim Torpy, worked in forestry with the then Ministry of Natural Resources for over 40 years, and I'm proud of the contribution he made and that your ministry uh, continues to make to Ontario. It's comforting to know that our government is taking steps to ensure that the everyday lives of people in rural communities are better thanks to actions taken by this government, something of which I know the member from Ren Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke would be proud. I'm also proud of the steps that our government is taking to ensure the forest industry in Ontario is sustainable. Speaker, could the minister please go into more detail about the forestry industry and why it is so important to Ontario? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Barry for her supplementary question. And I'm pleased to report that the forestry industry in Ontario generates $11 billion of economic activity and provides well-paying jobs for over 170,000 people in over 260 communities in Ontario. After announcements like the one in the Eganville sawmill, we're ensuring these numbers continue to grow, something we're very happy and proud of on this side of the House. Our exports of forest products have increased each year since 2012, with the total value of our wood product exports topping $6 billion in 2015. So last year alone, our manufactured forest product sales increased by over $1 billion over the year billion. before. I'm pleased to see that these numbers and know yes, that every day we're putting more Ontario wood to work. Ontario's forest sector will continue to grow thanks to the work our government's doing. Tomorrow in Cambridge, the Minister of Agriculture and I are cutting. Thank you. And of course, the member for the on Bruce. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment. Speaker, yesterday the Auditor General confirmed what we have known all along. The Liberals have no real plan to protect our environment. Shocking. The auditor revealed that this government's own analysis of their so-called action plan only forecasts a third of the pollution reductions they're promising. Wow. Instead, this government will be sending $2.2 billion to Quebec and California, California, excuse me, and guess where the emissions will be reduced? California. Speaker, unfortunately, it won't be Ontario. It'll be re the emissions will be reduced in California and Quebec, yet this government still plans to take $8 billion from people and businesses in Ontario. It's Shame. unacceptable. Shame. Speaker, it is time for this government to be honest. Will the minister finally admit that their cap and trade is not about the environment, Question. but instead a clever way to get into Ontarians' well, pockets? Mr. Speaker. I'm not enamored whatsoever with those kinds of heckles, and it's going to stop. <coughs> Minister. Thank you. First, I do want to thank the Auditor General. She made 15 recommendations on cap and trade. We have either implemented, I think we've now implemented the majority of them, and the balance of them will be implemented in the next year. And she has been very constructive and helpful. Um, on the numbers, I want to be very clear. The action plan and the work of David Sawyer and economists and experts, not my work, Mr. Speaker, shows 9.8 megatons of reductions as a result of the expenditure of $8 billion. 
You may notice, Mr. Speaker, that all of the large emitting industries, refining and chemistry, to cement, to the auto sector, supported cap and trade Answer. and are working on designing it. We have great confidence in the businesses of Ontario to meet those targets, and that $8 billion will be going back into the lives and pockets of Ontarians. Thank you. When you buy an electric car, you get $14,000 off. Thank you. Turn to the, the member from Simcoe Gray on a point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I believe you'll find we have uh, unanimous consent to observe a moment of silence in recognition of Roger Perrant. Mr. Perrant was a Saskatchewan MLA who tragically lost his battle with cancer. The member from Simcoe Gray is seeking unanimous consent for a moment of silence. Do we agree? Agreed. Agreed. I would ask all members to please rise in a moment of silence and respect for Monsieur Perron. Merci beaucoup. We have a deferred vote on the motion of second reading of Bill 70, an act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend various statutes. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
All members, please take your seats. On November 22, 2016, Ms. McGarry moved the second reading of Bill 70 and an act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend various statutes. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Domerlin. Mrs. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Vernil. Ms. Vernil. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Oh. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Uh, Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Tabins. Mr. Tabins. Mr. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Gelina. Madame Gelina. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Duval. The ayes being 49 and the nays being 44, I declare the motion carried. Pursuant to the order of the House dated November 30, 2016, the bill is ordered to refer to the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. We have a, a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 2, an act to amend and repeal various acts with respect to housing and planning. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
On November 30, 2016, Mr. Naki moved third reading of Bill 2, an act to amend and repeal various action with respect to housing and planning. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Brad. Mr. Brad. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandler. Mr. Sandler. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Ms. Darmerla. Ms. Darmerla. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jass. Ms. Jass. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Ronaldo. Mr. Ronaldo. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vanthoff. Mr. Vanthoff. Mr. Denova. Mr. Denova. Mr. Tabby. Mr. Tabby. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelly. Madame Jelly Knight. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Ayes being 93 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.